Hey, this is Daniel with another hard surface modeling video. My first one was a huge hit, one of my most played videos, and that tells me that you guys out there want to learn hard surface modeling ASAP. So here is part two. Let's start with a feature that I just recently learned, I think by accident. I'm gonna do Shift A and create a UV sphere. I'm gonna press period to zoom in. That's not the trick, although that is a very helpful feature there. Um, and here's the thing, press the letter W on your keyboard. This brings up this really cool object context menu with a lot of super helpful features all in one menu. Normally I would have had to go on searching in a few different menus to find these, but they're all in one place and I like it a lot. First of all, the shade smooth. Second, I love the fact that I can fix the origin point. So let's say I've been editing a complex shape and through the process of editing, I may have moved it off of its center point, which is right here. You can see this yellow dot. That is the, or not the 3D cursor, but the origin point right here. So I can fix that by selecting my object typing W, set origin, and I'm going to set uh, the origin to geometry. Now it'll put the, uh, put the origin point back right in the middle of my object. We've also got copy and paste, are two different ways to duplicate objects, which is a copy or a linked copy, and renaming right here, which is really handy, as well as some other cool things like snapping, parenting, my next trick involves saving a node group so that you don't ever have to make it again or even append it. So let's say you've made a material in your shaders tab. I'm gonna go up here and choose shader editor and I need an object for this to work. Let's just make the Susan monkey head and new material. And here is a node group that I've created to basically add scratches around on the surface of a mesh. Now let's say that you've made this super complex a node group with all kinds of stuff. You spend hours perfecting it and you don't want to, you know, of course you don't want to remake it again next time you want to use it. And even the append feature, which I personally find very annoying and, and clunky, uh, you don't have to do that again. So watch this. I'm going to uh, get out of the edit mode here and I, on the node group itself, I'm going to hit this shield, which gives it a fake user, which means that if, when I delete Susan, the uh, node group will still hang around in the background waiting for me to use again. And I'm going to delete Susan right there. And now I just do file and default save startup file. So this is going to save over your default startup file with a node group already waiting for you in the background. So when you make another mesh, you can very easily recall it with uh, little to no effort. It's actually in a material here, or you can do shift A and go to group and it'll be sitting here in your group folder. As you can see, I have a bunch of node groups that I've made and a few that I've downloaded for free online. You can find them just by searching or looking in the procedural textures Facebook group for Blender. Very cool stuff, very talented people out there making awesome shaders that you can use. And they're all just kind of waiting around for me to use. I use the same ones, you know, often. So I figure why not just put it in the startup file, save myself some time. I've been covering this lately in some of my recent videos, so check those out if you want to learn more about this. Okay, this next trick involves modeling an object one time and using it in various places uh, around your scene and multiple instances without having to edit or create each one. So I've got this metallic plane here. I'm going to shift A and add a, a cylinder to the scene, shrink it down, and I'm gonna give it a nice metallic kind of a silver texture. So turn up metal, turn up specular, and turn down roughness a little bit. There we go. So we got kind of a shiny aluminum. Now I'm going to press seven to go to my flat above view, and I'm going to move this to one of the corners because I want to do like a big bolt kind of structure. Now I want four of these bolts, but I don't want to have to make one each time. Or if I want to make a little tweak or an improvement to this bolt, I don't want to have to do the same work to the, all the other bolts in my scene. So in above view, I'm going to select my, what's going to be a bolt, and I'm going to press alt D to make a linked uh, duplicate of it. Now I'm gonna put these in the corner. So to be real precise, I'm gonna press the letter Y, which is going to allow me to slide it only on the Y axis and hit enter or click. Again, Alt D and X over here in this corner, Alt D and Y up here. So now I've got these four bolts. Well, watch, because these are linked duplicates, I can go into edit mode of say this bolt and I can start building it. Now, if you notice, I'm only editing this one time, but all the others are copying uh, what I do, which is a, a huge time saver, right? We only edit it once and the rest follow. Because these are linked to duplicates, everything except for position, rotation, and scale is copied, including material, the uh, shading, we make it a smooth shading there so it looks nice and round, and so on and so forth. So let's say we wanna have one of these break off from the rest. We wanna just do something unique. You know, we need it to be different, different color, um, and make a tweak or addition to it. We can do that uh, by breaking it off and making it an unlinked copy. So select your object you want to be uh, different from the rest, choose object, go to 
relations, make single user, and object and data and materials. Or if you want to keep the materials linked, you can just do object and data or just objects. But I'm going to do all three. So now I can edit this. It can be its own thing. And of course, I can add my own materials uh, and do whatever I want. And it can be different than the rest. I use this technique a lot for bolts, for you know technological pieces that are going to be repeating throughout my scene, maybe even structural pieces that they're OK if they look the same. But I need a whole bunch of them and I don't want to do a whole bunch of work. So hopefully that trick will save you some time. OK, next trick has to do with loop cuts. Let's make a cube and go into edit mode. Now, if you've been doing hard surface for a while, you know, uh, loop cut is control R and you can make a whole bunch of, you know, basically a ring or an edge around the whole uh, mesh. What if you want these edges, but only on one face? You don't want all these extra edges and, you know, uh, extra faces and things like that being created. Well, to do that, it's actually pretty easy. And I found a weird roundabout way to do it. Let's say we want to make a grill on this top face only, and we don't want any extra you know, edges and faces being created. Uh, let's go to edge select and grab this edge and this edge. So we've got two edges selected. And now we're going to subdivide these. So space bar for the search function, type in subdivide, and it's mesh subdivide right there, and increase that number to however many you want. And voila, we have just made uh, loop cuts on one face alone. Now you can do all kinds of stuff like make a grill, you know, um, do all kinds of cool shapes, things like that, uh, without creating additional things that you don't need. Uh, to do it the other at the other orientation, to select vertical pieces, that one and that one, spacebar, subdivide them however many times you need, and then you've got brand new faces to play with and do whatever you want with. This next trick is a way to basically mirror a, a set of object or an object um, across to the other side of your scene without actually using a mirror modifier. Let's say I've designed this robotic arm that has currently multiple meshes involved. You can parent them to each other to make them, you know, posable and movable. That's actually the last tip of my first hard surface modeling video, how to make a robotic arm without rigging it. We want another robot arm over here that we can still edit and pose differently because the mirror modifier would not let you pose differently because they'd be exact copies. So I'm going to select all the objects involved. I'm going to move this over here. And I'm going to use my 3D cursor as basically the, the, the mirroring point, right? Let's say this is the middle of the chest of this robot body we've made with all the objects selected. Let's go up here and set this to 3D cursor. And now we're going to do Alt D S Y negative one. And that will basically make a linked copy, which means editing and materials are the same, but uh, rotation and position is not. And we scaled it negative one on this axis. Uh, which, as far as I know, does not mess with normals, but we have an exact copy that we can still, you know, edit over here. We can, of course, pose and rotate this arm uh, however we want um, while, re while maintaining that linked copy. Okay, next tip has to do with the bevel modifier and how to control which edges exactly are being beveled so that we have complete, you know, decision and, and control over the beveling. So we've got our bevel modifier here. I'm going to expand it a little bit. Let's turn off clamp overlap so that we actually can tell the mesh how far to bevel things. Just don't go too far with that. Let's turn up our segments quite a bit to make it nice and round. And down here, we're going to choose weight. So instantly the bevel goes away. Why? Because the weight of all these edges is by default zero. So now let's go into edit mode, choose our edge selection. Let's say we want these edges specifically to be beveled. Well, then let's press in go to item and turn up the mean bevel weight. Look at that. Now only those faces are beveled and that looks nice and smooth. Now we say, oh, well, I think I want these ones as well beveled. We can grab these edges and turn that up to one, which is full bevel. And you can type in any number you want. So maybe I don't want full bevel. I want half. So you just do 0.5 and there we go. You have total control over what is being beveled and how much. I love having this amount of control. And of course, if we turn up the width of the offset, it you know enlarges everything basically proportionally. And it remembers that these are still 0.5. These are you know full 100% bevel. And that is really nice. All right, in this trick, I'm going to show you how to make a support trussing, which is really useful for all kinds of sci-fi stuff. Let's make a cube by doing Shift A, edit mode, and scale it up on the Z axis. And now let's do add a few loop cuts to make it evenly divided. So control R plus 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 right about there. Now let's select all the faces, spacebar for your search function, and type in triangulate. 
and we're going to go to mesh triangulate faces or it looks like control T will do the trick as well. Okay, and now we have all the flat faces turned into triangles. We're going to press I for inset and make sure it does this individual inset. If you get this solid and it's not doing anything, press I again a second time and you'll get this. Now we're gonna make this uh, kind of large triangles then press enter to uh, confirm that and we're gonna delete all these triangles. So delete them out of the way now you've got this cool, you know, support beam, but it doesn't look realistic. It's, it's flat and two dimensional, right? So to fix that, we can add a solidify modifier right here. Let's turn the thickness up a bit. We can play with these settings to get it nice and realistic looking. I just turned on even thickness. Okay, that looks pretty good. One last final touch we can do to add more realism is add a bevel modifier, turn up the segments, maybe to two or three, and make it as a real small, subtle bevel if you feel like you don't have enough control, turn off the clamp overlap and it'll give you a little bit more you know, leeway. Just be careful you don't do, go too far or it'll get crazy. Um, you can also set the limit to angle. Only 90 degree angles will be beveled if you put this at 89. There we go. So anything less than 89 it won't touch. Anything over 89, it will bevel. And that gives a nice uh, solid looking, you know, strong structure to this, uh, to this support beam. Okay, let's say we've made an asset or an object and we've accidentally moved it or we need to move it back to the center. Maybe we've accidentally rotated or we're ready just to kind of start over with the positioning. We can reset any of the object properties by pressing Alt G to reset the location, Alt R to reset the rotation. Of course, back to default zeros here. I'm gonna scale it up, watch this. So I'll scale it up. If I press Alt S, it goes back to, you know, one across the board for the scales. Okay, that's it for that tip. My last and final tip is how to make tubes with, uh, again, relatively little effort and a good payoff. So we're gonna make a single barrel type object with a cylinder. I'm gonna go into edit mode and just add a few kind of cool edge loops. I'm gonna speed this up so you don't get bored watching me. Okay, and I'm gonna shade smooth with W and then uh, go here and turn on auto smooth so it looks nice and high poly. We've got this barrel object. We're going to use an array modifier. Go to the wrench, select array, and we want it to array upwards. So not X, not Y, but Z. We wanna put the number one in this last field and add a bunch of copies. Let's just do 32, it's a good you know computer number. And next we're going to add another modifier, which is the curve modifier. Now this is basically going to conform this mesh to a curve. So first we need to draw a curve. So let's do shift A, select the Bezier curve, and I'm gonna press the forward slash so all I see is this instead of both objects together. So I'm gonna to go to edit mode, go to median and size everything up. And I want this to kind of be like a vertical curve. So I'm just gonna rotate it on that axis if you select one piece of a curve in edit mode, you can press E to extrude and rotate, and G, of course, will you know manipulate um, the curve itself. So I'm just gonna make really a kind of a random, twisty, windy, kind of curvy shape here, like a big mess of cables using uh, rotate and extrude. Okay, so we've got this. Weird little thing. Now select our cylinder. We need to press uh, forward slash again to get back into this normal mode. So with this selected in our curves modifier, our object is going to be Bezier curve. Now this looks terrible because we need to set it up correctly. So when we set up the array, it's going upwards on the Z axis and there we have it. So if you move your barrels you know, on the Z axis, it kind of slides up and down that curve. If you move it X or Y, don't do that because that's getting weird. It's no longer on along the same orientation as the curve. Similarly, if you get, grab the curve and if you move it, don't do that either. <laughs> so you want your object to be in the same starting place as your curve. I mean, you'll notice that this curve modifier is bending the mesh along the curve. So if you don't have enough faces or loop cuts in your cylinder, let's turn this on and that on, there we go. If you don't have enough loop cuts, it's gonna be a little weird. I have a decent amount of loop cuts, so it's not. Uh, there's not anything too noticeable. Um, if you even zoom in here, you can kind of see just how it bends. It's really, it's really cool. And uh, I like using this for, you know, sci-fi tentacles, for big chunky cables and wires that are going everywhere. Uh, you can make a lot of creative stuff. And of course, once you start texturing it and lighting it, it's just gonna look a hundred times better.
Well, I hope you enjoyed this video and learned some great techniques for hard surface modeling. Let me know in the comments if you learned something new or if you have a correction or an addition. And as always, thanks for watching. Have a great week.